was in a conversation, Sam. Were you singing? You want to hear about the conversation? Were you singing sixty songs, and was someone trying to stop you from doing that? That would be most of my conversations, but this particular conversation was with our friend Mike Stottlemyre. You know him? Oh yeah, Mike's great. Church Growth Services, one of the best generosity firms out there. Arguably the best, yeah. the best generosity firm. Yeah, I, I, I recommend him to a lot of churches for capital campaigns, budget campaigns. Uh, they're they're the best. Anyway, back back to the story. So I'm talking to Mike Stottlemyre, and we're talking about churches that are you know just barely hanging in there, barely hanging in there. And so you know we're talking about ways that we can work together, and we also talk about ways we can work with Brown the. Uh, construction firm, the three of us do some things to help churches together. So I got kind of excited about three organizations working together. I got excited about Brown talking about, you know, church building and church renovation, had a conversation with Ty Brown, then I had a conversation with Mike Stottlemyre, Church Growth Services, and just get my blood going. I mean, in a good way, in in a good way. Got really excited about that. And um, there was this common part of the conversation and the common part of the conversation was churches, some of them, if not many of them, are on the edge. And some of those are on the edge of death. That's going to be the topic we'll talk about. And again, I'm, I'm beginning to go in all kind of different directions as I want to do. But before we get going, let's start talking about something very important. Our incredible sponsor, Logos Faith Life. According to a recent survey, 30% of even church evangelical church goers want to go more in depth teaching. So if you want to go deeper in the word, Logos is the Bible study platform for you. Logos fuses powerful technology with biblical resources. We recently did a webinar with them. They talked about how you could access Bibles and search tools and commentaries, seminary level courses, audio books, over 200,000 digital books. It's unbelievable. So it's now more affordable than ever. Get started for just forty nine dollars. You can see the link. You need that link to get that price. Logos.com slash church answers. That was a fun webinar we did not too long ago. Yeah, it was a little different than what we typically do. um, But I thought it was extraordinarily helpful for uh, people who want to study God's word. I've started using the Logos library and I absolutely love it. It's bigger than it's more than a library. Obviously, they've got all sorts of tools in there that I'm it's becoming my default search engine for anything Christianity Bible related. Ooh, I've stopped. I've stopped using the Googles, and I've started using Google. I've, Google sends you down so many rabbit trails. Yeah, yeah. So get off the Googles and get on the Logos. That's that's what I would say. Oh, that's what I've done. I like that. That can be a new slogan when we talk about our partnership with Logos. I don't think they're going to pick it up as a slogan, but we can just for, we can just <laughs> force it on them because this is our show. Yeah, I like it. I, I, I like it. And there's some days I use Logos and then other days to alternate, I use Logos. Yeah, I'm still a little confused. Is it Logos, Logos, Logos? I don't know. Um, but it really doesn't matter how you pronounce it, so long as you use the resource. It's really good. It's a good one. So going back to this conversation about churches that are not doing well, in fact, some of the churches on the edge of death that survive. My best-selling book ever, Sam, was I Am a Church Member. Do you know my second best-selling book? Autopsy of a Deceased Church. You're so right. Yeah, good, good, good guess there. Good recollection. I did a contrarian book to Autopsy of a Deceased Church called Anatomy of a Revived Church. Autopsy with the churches that were on the edge of death, then fell right over, boom, dead. Yeah, I remember that book. Uh, I helped edit it. Did you? Yes. You've already forgotten. You've helped with so many. You've helped with so many books. Well, it's, it's it, you. You do ask me on occasion to help edit your books, and I'm a C minus D plus kind of editor. So uh, I'm just glad that we use Tyndale for a lot of our stuff now. So um, yes, <laughs> their editors are far better than me. Yeah, exactly. And then when we do our own stuff, we have a pretty good editor on our own, editors, but pretty good editor on our own team as well. We do. I'm the same with you. I'm I'm not a good editor, but uh, so I wrote. Anatomy of a Revived Church. Uh, it's being re-released by Tyndale. It's, it's just out in its hardcover form. And it's about churches that were on the edge of death and didn't go, boop, dead. In fact, they went the other way, stood up and said, hey, I'm alive. So a lot of churches die. Some of those churches get very close and then they don't die. Hmm. And we're going to talk about those. And if you're interested in a full book length treatment of this, read 
my book, Anatomy of a Revived Church. So question for you, Sam, why would be, why would getting to the state at the edge of death where you could fall either way into death or having a second chance as a church, why, 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 what, what good could come out of that? And uh, there's the obvious bad, but I'll let you answer both. What bad and good can come out of that? Well, yeah. I and mean, I like to hike. Um, so getting to the precipice of something, you know, you, you recognize where you are. You, you're not going to go any further without dying, right? Or you're going to come back from the edge. Um, so when you get to the edge, it's an either or scenario, uh, which puts you in the place of making some very hard decisions. Um, it's not a good place to be, generally speaking, unless it turns you around. Um, because you're yeah. on the path to death. You're about to walk over the edge. You're about to fall to your death. Um, but when you get to the precipice, it can get your attention. And in the cases where churches turn around, well, they recognize we are at the edge and they turn back from the edge. The only, and for a lot, of, it's it's the old adage, you got to hit rock bottom before you look up, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of churches, they got to get to the edge before they realize it's time to turn around. But don't wait till you get to the edge. Don't think that that is a destination so you can turn around. <laughs> yeah, it's always yeah. better to turn around before the edge. Actually, believe it or not, uh, we um, we foster churches. We've done several fostering scenarios um, and to, to different degrees. And there's one where we've been working with the church. And the previous pastor led them as if they were going to die, assuming oh. that he was going to give the campus away to the denomination. Well, <laughs> it's not okay. good. That's not leadership. Don't do that. Uh, it's a terrible oh, work to death. Yeah, Let us go together. It's a terrible thing to do. Um, but you're right. I guess you could lead a church that direction, but it's not. It's not a very helpful exercise. Yeah, uh, I was in Portugal a couple of days with my trainer Tommy, and uh, we 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 on got the on treadmill the in your house for everyone who's just now listening. Like, it's, wow, I, he travels the world to to do his exercise. No, you get on a treadmill in your basement, and you have a subscription service that allows you to go to different places. Well, Tommy got and he. He, he said, we don't want to get too close to the edge. And he uses this phrase because we don't want to get dead. Yeah. So don't get to there. There were some, there's some beautiful cliffs in South Portugal, just right on the water. Yeah. And um, he, he said one of the primary principles of running, especially in places where you've never been before that are fairly remote is don't get dead. Don't get dead. So, I, you know what? That's probably but, the best advice we've ever given in the history of church answers. Don't get dead. Don't get dead. Don't, don't get dead. Well, that's that's Tommy Reels. That's, that's the name he goes by. Tommy Reels Pussy is his full name, but he goes by Tommy Reels. Hey, that's the same guy that during COVID was on the edge of death. Yeah. You remember me telling you that story? Yeah. I mean, his story is fascinating. You know it better than I do, um, but he he came back from the edge himself. And it is a pretty did. pretty and, remarkable story. And now, now I do my recovery walks with him. In, in an island off Spain, and he can barely walk. Wow! So he he led me running, and now he's barely walking. And uh, he 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 just he tells a story. He had three cases of COVID, and an aggressive rare lung cancer, probably caused by pesticide as a child. So he knows about being on the edge of death. He well, there's knows. a there's a lot of churches that are there, um, unfortunately, uh, far yep. far too many. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I think this episode will resonate with, with too many people. Well, the second principle is um, sad. Most of the time, if you're going to come back and be a revived church, there will be necessary exits, necessary departures. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know of a church, Sam, that was headed in the negative direction that turned around positive that didn't have significant departures. I don't either. I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure somebody could point to a church of 10 or 12 or 15 where all everyone was in agreement and turned around. But for the most part, you know, you get a, a church that's, well, it's struggling and it's smaller uh, and it doesn't have the finances to keep it going. And they got there for a reason. And a lot of times it's the people that are there that are the problem. Um, and not everyone agrees with the turnaround. And you, if you do the right thing, you tend to lose some. Uh, I won't say that you're going to lose all or most, but certainly some will exit. 
Uh, and it is a sad principle to, to relay to everyone, but it's a necessary part of a turnaround. It is. Uh, ultimately, that cliche, the church is not the building, it's the people. And I get tired of the cliche because there's an implication behind it for some that it means attendance is not important, gathering is not important, which I loathe to hear. But it, it, it is that. And sometimes, the, the, well, it, it's always that. And the church, it, the church are the people. The church is the people. I'm trying to think subject verb agreement there. Church is the people. Uh, if, if, if those people have led it to this point, to the edge of death, some of them may have to go in another direction, sadly, yeah. for the church to have hope. Point three that we brought up. Sometimes getting to the edge of death means you really have to start depending upon God. And that sounds maybe a bit condescending, but that is true that sometimes we try to do all the human machinations that we think are necessary. We get help from a denomination. If we are in a denomination, we may call on someone to provide us guidance. We try programs and finally we get to the point where we say only God can turn this around. And so we turn to prayer. That's probably a pretty, not probably, that is a good thing for, as we look to the anatomy of churches that were revived. Yeah. Um, so necessary exits and a lot of prayer. Uh, that's a good start right there. If you are at the precipice, um, this is how you're going to survive. Um, and it's, here's the thing. It's always messy. It's going to be ugly. It's not easy. Like for you to come back, uh, this is, there's no, as we like to say, what silver bullet? Silver bullet. Yeah, there's no silver bullet. Now, I'm just thinking. Dangerous for me at this age, but I'm just thinking. Yeah, don't 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 do blow a gasket or whatever. <laughs> don't think too something. hard. That engine's got a lot of miles on it. <laughs> oh, God, thank you so much. <laughs> so I just just consider me a, a, a Honda, and I'm just going to keep on going. Okay, so if I recall correctly, because Anatomy started off as a book at Rainer Publishing, I think you read this book at least rough, not necessarily copy edit, but I think you read it probably among the first to read it. Am I wrong? I would have been. I've read all of your books, by the way. All I have. 30, 30 whatever of them. I have read them all. Well, the reason I'm saying that is because – we have such affection for you and anatomy that it just, it just hit me. Yeah. And this is a complete inside joke just to our family. So for the sake of our listeners, um, I learned a lot. <laughs> Apparently I learned a lot in my anatomy class and, when I was in high school and my, my family likes to poke fun at me over that. But that joke well, goes back to when I was learning. like 14 years old. It's, it's, it's old. And at this point, and our listeners don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I care, Sam. Uh, I mean, whether it was brick laying or driving a car, you told us you learned it in anatomy. I learned, I learned everything in anatomy. Yeah, <laughs> that was what. Your brothers aren't going to stop, so I'm not going to. Oh, stop. that's fine. I got plenty of dirt on them too. So if they if they want to come at me, come at me, I bro. <laughs> both of you, Jess and Art. <laughs> Another thing that happens in these or happened in these churches that were on the precipice of death and turned around. They stopped blaming everybody and everything else. It's the preacher's fault. It's the culture's fault. Some of them said it's the neighborhood's fault. They know we're here, so why don't they come here? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's other members' fault. They are not doing this. It's a pretty good thing when the blame game stops. This this was this was a major reason why our Southside campus ended up turning around um, was because the people that were there stopped blaming each other. They stopped blaming the neighborhood, and they stopped blaming wow. the past. Um, this is a huge step when you realize, in fact, they would say things like this. They would say, we haven't done what we needed to do and we're ready to, to turn around. Um, I love it. when, when you get to that point, when you've come back from the edge, when you're praying, when you've had the exits that just needed to happen and you say, you know what, we're going to do what we have to do. We're going to stop blaming people around us. Um, you know, you're beginning to, you're not healthy. <laughs> you're not healthy at that point, but there's hope. Um, there's, there's an actual chance to, to get this thing turned around. But if your people, if, you know, if you're, if you're still on that precipice and people are, are blaming each other or the, whatever else they're blaming, uh, it's, there's not a lot of hope. I mean, God can turn anything around, of course, and you keep praying through it, but 
it's going to be it's going to be hard unless people look inward to look outward. They look in, look inward to know we messed up to look outward to say we got to reach the neighborhood. As you know, I was in a consultation as we're recording this a few days ago, giving them their uh, final report, and it was it was terrible. It's one of the worst experiences I've had as a consultant. Uh, the church the second second uh, worst of all time, and we have done a lot of consultate hundreds. If I don't know, it's tough to count. Maybe even close to a thousand consults at this point. Depending on how you count them. When, when you look at the fact that we do a lot of coaching slash consultation, it's in the thousands. It could be. This was one of the two worst ever, and I led both of them. Yeah, and I feel for you. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't yeah. there. <laughs> you would have had that just fine. I, I thrive in those situations a little more than you do. Um, but, oh, gosh. <laughs> tell me about it. But <laughs> cause, Anyway, I, I might have. I might have uh, pushed back a little harder than you did. You're, you're a little more gracious in those situations. Well, I was quiet on this one. I, I really didn't respond in grace when they call me a liar and when they when they call me a charlatan. They followed you out in the parking lot after your presentation. <laughs> continuing people with the followed insults. me out in the parking lot, yes. I mean, one, I thought one 91-year-old guy was going to beat me up. He was, he was so mad. Uh, but but what, why is it the consultation report defined reality? Now to the churches, you told them the you unless you guys do evangelism, you're going to die. That's what you said. Just for our listeners, like how did they get so angry? <laughs> you told them unless you start doing evangelism, you're dead. <laughs> and they well, got I, gave them the I, I did. I gave them the numbers. I said, here is how many you're losing. If you continue this trend, if you don't start reaching people for Christ, you're going to die. Yeah, that makes Listen me so angry, God. Dad. I cannot believe that you would say such a terrible thing. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that time was the blame game. They blamed me, you know, the, the messenger, they blamed the pastor, they blamed the community. They particularly blamed a uh, community of a different socioeconomic strata, uh, lower than theirs, uh, because they wouldn't come to their church. I'm just trying to listen. They blamed the denomination they blamed the general communication of the church, and then they started blaming each other. I don't put this as one of my successful consultations. <laughs> I, I told you then, and I will tell you now, there wasn't much hope for this one. Um, but there's always hope. Like I, that I wrote church revitalization checklist for this very reason. There's always hope. Um, oh, yeah. We need to put that in the show notes, too. Yeah, that's what I mean. Th that's what the whole book is about, that, uh, you know, it's an optimistic perspective on revitalization. But if you're still blaming people and everyone around you in the community, it's it's very hard to even think like a Christian, much less revitalized church. This point uh, we've talked about so many times, but it's still worth mentioning. The church learned to love its community again. That's, you know, when we, when someone gets a know your church report from us and they want to really, at least from a data point of view, understand their church from a demographic and then psychographic point of view, what the community's thinking, behavior patterns, that to me is hopeful because at least they're trying to learn the community. So every time one of those reports go out, I say, there is a report of hope. Absolutely. Uh, there's people all around churches and they're there to be reached. Uh, you can't reach your community unless you love your community. And if you don't love your community, you certainly won't reach them. I mean, it's just that, yeah. I mean, you, you have to serve the people around you. This is the great commandment. You know, you've got the great commission, you've got the great commandment. You have the great promise that the gospel will be preached um, and then the end will come. Uh, these are very basic principles in the New Testament. And unfortunately, the North American church is guilty of not following them. But the churches that do turn around, well, they look at their community, they say, I love you, and they serve the community. It is mm -hmm. that simple. It is, but, but, but rarely, but rarely done. Uh, when I was presenting that consultation report, I did not see much of the great commandments. So just moving on from that experience. I'm still, <laughs> still, a, little, still a little bruised, but I'll get over it. Uh, when a church is revived, Anatomy of a Revived Church is somewhat what we're talking about here in my new uh, release on Anatomy of a Revived Church. When when the church is revived, 
they put everything on the table. In other words, those non-negotiables are non-negotiables. The gospel is the gospel exclusivity of salvation through Christ. We could go down the list, but everything that is not Bible centric is put on the table. And they say, well, we'll change what we need to change. That's the essence of it. Well, I give a lot of credit to the people at Southside. This is our Southside campus. We fostered them first, then we adopted them. They put everything on the table. Um, they sold part of the campus, which was painful. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, look back and you're like, oh, man, we shouldn't have sold that. But it was the only way to survive. It was the only way we were going to fund the revitalization. So we sold part of the campus. We tore down the sanctuary. I know it's but for thinking of the memories that went down with the physical structure. And it just, there was, it was not able to be saved. Um, and they were willing to become a campus of a church right down the road and launch, uh, relaunch as a multi ethnic church, um, which needed to happen, uh, and serve 200 homeless people a week on their campus. <laughs> you know, talk about socioeconomics. Yeah, you're, you're, you're inviting a very, difficult crew to reach. Um, they're necessary to serve them and very rewarding to serve them, but but hard to reach. Um, so they literally put everything on the camp, on, on the table. They said, okay, we're going to become a campus. We'll sell part of the campus. We'll tear down the sanctuary. We'll serve the homeless. We'll become a multi-ethnic church. And you know what? They just got above the median church size in the United States. So they have crested over um, to become larger than normal at like 75, 80 people, <laughs> but they're there. They have crested That's over incredible. that median church size of 65 people. That is, you know, that, that is something it's, it's in the top 50% now, the church that was handful of people on the, on the edge of death. That didn't have a pastor, didn't have a whole lot of hope, didn't know what to do. And now you've got two services in two languages and a lot of good stuff happening there. I love that story. I do. Well, we've been talking about churches that were on the precipice of death that did not die. Uh, again, if you want to look at the book link, the treatment of this, go to Anatomy of a Revived Church. And uh, also look at Sam's, Sam's really, really popular book, and good book on church revitalization checklist. Uh, those are two books that kind of go hand in hand. One is how do we do a revitalization? And the other is basically inspiring stories of churches that did turn around if you're willing to pay the cost. So they will definitely complement each other. Sam, we thank a lot of people when we're at Church Answers. I mean, we we, we thank Brown, our, our partner in uh, church facilities. We thank Church Growth Services, our partner in, in uh, stewardship. And hey, they're the and, ones that uh, got the conversation started this time. Yep. Both Brown exactly. and Church Growth Services. Yep, Exactly. We're, we're thankful for, for Logos and the partnership there. We're thankful for Tyndale, which um, has just been an incredible partnership. We're thankful for Christian Book and the fact now that uh, through a partnership with them, we have a full Christian store. But we're going to conclude this with a specific thanks for Tyndale, and you're going to do it through the One Year Bible and what they're offering there, Sam. We are grateful to Tyndale. We're grateful for the resources that they offer, specifically the One Year Bible for Men and the One Year Bible for Women. The One Year Bible for Women and the One Year Bible for Men combine the best-selling best -selling daily Bible reading format with two-minute daily devotionals. The One Year Bible for Women has devotionals written just for women, and the One Year Bible for Men, as you might expect, has devotionals written specifically for men, creating a one-of-a-kind kind of unique devotional Bibles. So they feature the trusted and understandable, the reliable, the great New Living Translation. And they have mm. daily readings in them that include passages from the Old Testament and the New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. Um, each daily reading also includes a short devotional. So you can take these Bibles and pair them together for couples devotions. That is a really good idea. But they're also perfect for individual daily devotional moments as well. So thank you, Tyndale, for giving us the one-year Bible for men the One Year Bible for Women. All of you listeners, go check it out. Um, and thank you for tuning in to this episode. You know what? You may be on the edge, but you can come back through the power of God, the power of prayer. And if you're willing to just put it on the table, guess what? Your church can be revitalized. So thank you. And we'll see you on the next episode.